Uh, hello all, welcome back from the break. We're in the home stretch of the talks. Uh, my name is Ryan Huang. I'm from Duke University, right next door in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And today I'll be talking to you about uh, using animal tracking to investigate the causes of changes in uh, sooty tern breeding. So humans have known for millennia about the relationship between birds and the oceans. Uh, fishermen for thousands of years have been following birds and using them to find uh, their catch. And more recently, scientists are starting to use more and more biological data to monitor ocean health. Uh, this is often the case because physical measurements tend to be somewhat erratic and uh, are more difficult to interpret over short time periods. In addition, bird populations can often predict fishery collapses more quickly than typical catch per unit effort data. So for example, here what we can see is that the, sea, the diet of seabirds will change more quickly than you would normally get from your catch per unit data. And this is often because uh, humans are much better at getting all the last bit of that fishery than the birds are. So we can detect that change. Uh, quicker. So the indicator species I want to talk to you today is uh, the sooty tern. And these guys are a very common seabird uh, found in both the uh, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And they have very large range. So if there's a threat to the ocean, these guys are going to be encountering it. And they uh, will be reflected in their population. Uh, in addition, the population I work with, uh, we've got banding records going back to the 1930s. And I've got over 750,000 individuals in my database. So this is a really big data set that I can use to tease out population trends over time. Uh, in addition, this is one of the species that the National Park Service is interested in continuing their monitoring efforts. So this here is a map uh, showing where we've recovered uh, banded sooty terns. And you can see they can pretty much go from the Gulf of Mexico all the way out to Western uh, Africa. Now that's a huge chunk of real estate. That's a lot of open ocean. And the thing about this map is it doesn't really tell us where the birds live. It only tells us where the birds die. So it's, we're missing out on a lot, of, a lot of information there. And that's one of the big difficulties with working with seabirds is that you really can't follow them after they leave the island. Uh, it's very tough to figure out where they're going. And it's especially true with the sooty tern that the adults spend six months of the year totally above the open ocean. They don't uh, see land for half the year. And that's also true for the uh, young after they fledge they won't return back to land for about five to six years. Nobody knows where they go. We have no idea. We, we figure open ocean somewhere. So speaking of the breeding island, this is my field site. Uh, this is the Dry Tortugas National Park. Rolling Stones magazine named it one of the top 10 coolest places you have never been to. Um, yeah, uh, so for those of you who don't know, don't know the, the park, uh, it is about 100 kilometers west of Key West. So that's about a two to four hour boat ride. And it was designated a national park in 1992, and it hosts over 750,000, or sorry, 75,000 breeding uh, adults every year. Uh, the terns will arrive in about mid-January to lay their eggs and then leave about mid-June. Now, this is a really important point, and I want you, want you all to remember that because we're going to get back to that. But if you notice in the other uh, photo, we've got this really cool structure here called Fort Jefferson. So that was, it started its construction in 1846, and it was originally built to defend the Gulf shipping lanes. Uh, and it was never completed, nor did it ever see military action. But instead, it's most famous, uh, it's most well known for uh, serving as a prison. And its most famous inmate being this man, Dr. Samuel Mudd. Uh, who, for those of you who don't know, he was the doctor who treated John Wilkes Booth after his infamous jump onto the stage uh, after the assassination of President Lincoln. So, so why the history lesson? Well, other than the fact that I'm hoping to get commission from Florida Tourism to get you all to visit Director Tugas National Park, uh, Fort Jefferson was also home to th uh, this woman, Emily Holder, who was the wife of the doctor stationed there. And during her time there, she wrote a memoir called At the Dry Tortugas During the War. And in this memoir, she has something really interesting to say about our birds. In June, the birds always came in thousands to lay their eggs on Bird Key, the season being in the nature of a festival and a feast for us as we made our egg collecting parties. So for those of you paying attention, the key word here is June. In 1860, these birds were starting their breeding season in uh, mid-June. Whereas now we see these birds lay, uh, coming to the island in mid-January. That's a five-month shift in breeding season. You really can't get further away on the calendar than these birds have. So why the change? Climate change is uh, one uh, particular hypothesis, but there's a lot of other potential drivers. So what, for us to kind of figure out what might be causing this, we wanted to first pinpoint when the shift in breeding season might have first started occurring. So for that, we go back to the banding data. Uh, so here is a plot simply uh, illustrating the dates of the first arrival of breeding uh, adults. And from here, you can kind of see that the birds had a relatively unchanging arrival time until about 1940, 1950.
then you can see that the, uh, the adults were arriving earlier and earlier every year. So what happened in the late 1940s, early 1950s? Well, in 1949, uh, large populations of shrimp were found off Key West. And that prompted dozens and dozens of shrimping boats to come uh, to Key West and start the sh uh, Key West shrimping industry. The media uh, likened this to the Yukon Gold Rush. And uh, Key West shrimp was uh, quickly given the name Pink Gold. Within the first year of fishing, uh, 15 million pounds of shrimp were caught in the area. Now, when you have high amounts of shrimping, you're going to get a lot of bycatch, too. So we hypothesized that if the birds started finding and following the shrimp boats around this time period, they would have easy access to bycatch and easy access to food, which would prompt them to be reproductively active and ready earlier in the calendar year, and thus allowing them to return to the island at an earlier time uh, period. So for us to kind of figure that out, we really need to narrow down where these birds go. So once again, when they leave the island, we have no idea where they are in the world. So for that, uh, I, our first attempt was to use these little guys. These little data loggers measured uh, light intensity every 12 minutes. So on a given uh, calendar day with a given day length, we know what the latitude of the individual is. And the relative timing position of sunrise will give us what the longitude is. So thus, we can kind of track where the birds are at. So I turned to my contact, Sonny Bass, with the National Park Service to grab me a bird. We'll outfit it. And then we are left with a little individual who looks like he's under house arrest. He's got a little anklet going on right there. but. Uh, so and then this is the data that we get. So bear with. So um, see if I don't know if you can see the uh, the time point here, but here we go. So oh god, okay. Well, um, let's try starting that again. Uh, there we go. Okay. So at the bottom we can see it's this starts in about early April, and the birds are kind of hanging around uh, Key West there. And so this is the first time we ever saw where where these birds kind of go. Um, and here in about mid-June, you'll see that they leave the island, and they're going to go right along kind of the coast of South America. Now, some of these big shifts that you're about to see right like there, those aren't actually indicative of where the turn actually is. What's happening is these, these birds are encountering, tro are encountering tropical storms that blot out the sun, and thus giving a shorter day length, tricking the data logger into thinking that it is a uh, shorter day and that the birds are farther south than they actually are. So now we can see that they head out to this mid-Atlantic area where they'll kind of hang out for the, some of the winter months. And then uh, momentarily in about uh, mid-December to January, they're going to head straight back and make a beeline right for, there you go, right for the breeding grounds. Um, so, and then we got one more guy. But anyway, so you can see that there's a lot of issues with these data loggers, right? Well, the first and foremost is that you actually have to recapture the individuals in order to obtain the data. And in a nesting colony of 75,000 birds, it is a figurative needle in the haystack. So of, of which we, so we deployed 20, uh, we recovered four, of which only two of them had any usable data. Uh, the other two had broken prongs, and the data was unrecoverable. But not only is the data really difficult to obtain, it has a lot of error, as you saw. So plus or, six, uh, plus or minus six minute margin of error is actually going to translate into a very large latitudinal error as well. And this is especially true around the spring and fall equinox when all points on a given longitude are going to experience 12 hours of daylight. So the data loggers really have no idea how far north or south you are. So we can take a look at that. Uh, that, is that this is the data we originally get from one of the data loggers. And you can see that there's these really large uh, ranges in points. right? And those will be, once again, around the equinox. And the same thing is if we plot the difference in latitude between consecutive points, we get these giant spikes here. And uh, once again, it's, it's you know, spring and fall equinox, respectively. The same thing is true if we look at how much uh, latitudinal error we get with a simple five-minute margin of error. And you can see uh, with Julian days, it just spikes right here. So we needed something better. We needed something that was, we could get the data, we could obtain the data more easily, and it has, was far more accurate. So we needed to turn to satellite transmitters. The thing is that these birds clock in about 200 grams, too small for traditional satellite transmitters. However, new and improved out of microwave technology uh, we got the five gram solar powered uh, transmitter. They only released within the last year or so. And these guys are cool. They uh, transmit every hour or so. And then when the battery empties out and it uh, fully charges up using the solar power, which is really quick up on the open ocean, uh, really not too much cover there, uh, it'll reset the duty cycle and thus start the hourly transmissions again, thus giving us as high temporal resolution data as we really could get from these guys. Um, so once again, I turn to Sonny Bass and tell him to get me another bird. We outfit it with the new uh, PTT, and he's got now a fashionable new fanny pack rather than the old anklet. 
Um, so now this is the data we're going to get from those guys. And you can see that, so this here is the Dry Tortugas National Park there. And there's this nice cloud of points uh, going out here. Now, we deployed these transmitters out in February of this year. And we deployed them on three different individuals. Unfortunately, this last one stopped transmitting about two weeks after uh, deployment. But we still have this nice kind of cloud of data here. And using a kind of a simple kernel density here, uh, we can kind of look at where these birds are going. And we can, you can only barely just start to see, but there's some areas of kind of preferential feeding grounds, which are of total uh, conservation importance, uh, because now we have not some idea of where we could possibly close off areas of fisheries. Uh, these areas are clearly important for the birds. And thus, uh, we can kind of protect populations uh, by closing off certain specific areas, targeted areas. But let's go back to the idea. What about the shrimp boats? Uh, we have this great hypothesis. Well, if we plot it with, over data from NOAA, we can see it's actually surprising very little overlap. In fact, the shrimp boats tend to prefer to stay all close to the coast here. Meanwhile, the birds will all kind of go off kind of closer to this continental shelf. It's actually, so, but we do see that there's actually some overlap right around outside of the park here. So we know that these birds are encountering the shrimp boats, yet for some reason they don't want to follow them and get access to that easy bycatch. So if it's not something anthropogenic in origin, well, maybe it's something environmental. So I annotate the data with sea surface temperature, and we kind of see that the birds want to go further away and prefer the water that is colder than average for these areas. This makes some, uh, some amount of sense when we kind of take a step back and kind of look at average sea surface temperatures for the area. And when we kind of look, they're all heading up to the north to this kind of colder area here. The birds are never going east or south or west where they might encounter the Gulf Stream in this really warm area. They always tend to prefer to go for this kind of colder area. And we can see this graphically as well, too, in that if we plot Euclidean distance away from the island, uh, kind of against that, te that temperature differential, we see that the birds really are going to go, you know, tend to want to go further away for that colder water. Unfortunately, that's about all the results I've got for you guys now. Um, so and we know that these sooty terns are kind of being disturbed as evidenced by their shift in the breeding regime. Something, something is changing these guys' behavior. Uh, we're not entirely sure if you know, this cause is environmental and or anthropogenic in uh, origin, but that's why we need all the, saddle, uh, the animal tracking is to kind of define or narrow our search window as to look for where these causes might be and where these birds might be overlapping with any potential threats. So the mystery still remains unsolved, and I would love to hear what people have to think about it. And with that, I'll take any questions. So, I saw your hand up. Go first. It's it's so it's it's tough to say. So this is something I've kind of thought about, and it's. We have, we have all this uh, banding effort of chicks after they fledge, which you know that's when they fledge in about uh, June and they get to adult size. But it's tough to say because the banding effort is so variable from year to year that it's really hard to say. So we, I've got an, uh, an absolute number of uh, chicks you know, banded, but I have no idea what proportion you know, tried or how much that changes from year to year. No, no obvious decline. And in fact, you know, going back to that memoir, as you can tell, like they, they talk about how difficult it was just to walk across the island without stepping on eggs. And you, you can still see that's you know, similarly the case today. Um, yeah. Um, when you look at the temperature variation, uh, are you looking for fronts? Because if, if you uh, see the related to shrimping, yeah. the uh, so Yeah, so, so the, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question on the last one. So the question was, uh, for the sea surface temperature, am I looking for fronts? The, the trick is that this has been kind of a narrow time window. Okay? It's only been a couple months. So there's really not too, much, um, too many variations I've been able to kind of look at between. But I, it's, it's, I'm trying to get more and more environmental data. And I'm trying to throw as many different uh, possibilities at it. So I've been working closely with uh, some meteorological people out of U uh, Miami to try and look at which other changes in uh, kind of that environmental data. Because that sea surface temperature stuff, that, that's results I've kind of only come up with within the last couple of weeks. So. Yeah. And what's the one comment? So maybe yeah. apart from looking at the atmospheric stuff, if you're trying to relate to the string after, you might think more like a fishery person. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's probably a good point. I, it's, it's one of those things that uh, Duke University has a great uh, marine lab as well. And I really need to kind of mine them for more information on the fisheries yeah. aspect.
Yes, I, I agree. And I'm trying to start looking into fish behavior as well and trying to figure out why they, they if, you know, the birds are probably following the fish and such and are, you know, if the fish are preferring these colder waters too, that's going to explain a lot. But um, any other questions? I, you know, I've never, never considered that. Um, I, the, thing about, the thing about that, actually, the reason I would argue against it is because if you go back to that graph I had, um, it's, a pre, it's, it's a pretty, you know, straightish line. Whereas now you see that earlier, or I mean, earlier, I don't know. It just seems like it's changing more now rather, rather than being stable for so long. Not to mention that straight line goes back, you know, another 100 years or so. So I don't know. I mean, it, I haven't really given that much thought to it, but... Uh, my guess would be unlikely. Uh, in the back there. I've, I've looked at, so the question was uh, if, if uh, the Mississippi algal blooms might infect it. I've looked at ocean chlorophyll levels, and the whole area is pretty homogenous right in that area. In fact, the only spikes you see are very close to the, um, the uh, very close to the coast. So there's a couple of outlets outside of, uh, uh, kind of by the panhandle of Florida that you kind of see these big algae blooms, but there's definitely nothing to suggest anything coming nearly as far south as Key West. I saw one more. I was just wondering how this infection is going to affect the uh, seabed. If there's lots of seabed, yeah. the bycatch is going to go out So the, yeah, so the question is, is how, how fishing practices change and how that might affect. So there's a couple things. So there's actually a couple holes in that hypothesis originally, one of which is in the 1980s uh, with Castro kind of in power, it, there was a big movement for what's called Freedom Flotilla, where uh, shrimp boats would suddenly get paid by the US government to take in Cuban refugees and bring them back to America. And then, but it turns out that uh, Castro was just releasing his prisoners and uh, victims of, you know, insane asylums. And so the American government quickly was like, no, 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 stop doing that. But uh, eventually the, the shrimp boats were still doing it. And so they, a lot of them actually got arrested for that. And the, there was a huge dip in the shrimp boat industry after in the 80s. And they're still kind of recovering from that. But so that's one thing. So there was a, you know, there was a big change in the shrimp boat practices in the 80s. But the other thing is that just about eight, 10 years ago, uh, we've noticed a couple times. So sometimes these birds regurgitate when they get stressed and we capture them. And uh, we've noticed that sometimes they are regurging up, regurgitating jawfish, which is a benthic fish. Now these fish or these birds don't have oil glands, so they don't get wet, and they're not diving birds. They really kind of skim off the top. So the question was, how are these birds getting benthic fish if not from bycatch? And so that's a pretty recent observation. It's not a very common observation, but it was something that was supporting the potential of, that they're following these trawlers. But you know, it seems to be not the case. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I have one question. Do yeah. shrimpers, do, do the fishermen, do they see, don't they see a box of... Uh, I've, so I've asked them. Um, they say that they see them around the national park. But once again, it's one of those things that, you know, we, we could see that from the efforts, but they don't... I haven't been able to talk to some of the ones that are further away up along the coast, but it, it seems like the evidence is that they're not... There is really no overlap there. 